We are indeed honored and, and privileged to have, uh, for the first time in our um, understanding, this marks the first time we have had two immediate past ambassadors from both sides of the Pacific who served concurrently and who are both out of government and I half joked with them last night that they can be as candid as they'd like to be and don't hold any punches uh, even though we do have quite a bit of media here for this. <laughs> so um, anyway this is uh, something we've all been looking forward to and I'm very honored to introduce the chair and moderator who is someone who has spoken for us in the past at Japan American Society and we're glad to have him back from up north. He is the professor of political science at the University of California, Berkeley. Please welcome Stephen Vogel. And in turn, it is my great pleasure to introduce our two distinguished guests today. I'll begin with Ambassador Ichiro Fujisaki. He is currently the president of the American Japan Society. He's a distinguished professor and Chairman of International Strategies at Sophia University. And he's also the Distinguished Professor at Keio University and the advisor to the city of Tokyo. So I guess just being professor at one university is not good enough. Uh, he was the Ambassador of Japan to the United States from 2008 to 2012, a very interesting period. I think we're going to be hearing about that. Prior to that, he was the Ambassador of Japan to the United Nations in the WTO in Geneva. He was Deputy Foreign Minister at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs back in Tokyo. He was Director General for North American Affairs. He was a political minister in the Embassy in Tokyo in, in, in Washington. And he's also been Deputy Director General for Asian Affairs. Um, he uh, joined the Foreign Ministry in 1969, and he's also been in other posts, including the Ministry of Finance, Jakarta, Paris, and London. Ambassador Roos was U.S. Ambassador to Japan from August 2009 to 2013, a similar and equally interesting period um, in Japan. Um, he became the first sitting U.S. Ambassador ever to attend the commemoration ceremony of the atomic bombing in Hiroshima and then also in Nagasaki. His service also coincided with the devastating earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear crisis on March 11, 2011. Um, subsequent to that, he led the effort to create the Tomodachi Initiative that followed U.S. disaster relief efforts um, and forged a U.S.-Japan government-private, public-private partnership um, uh, designed to invest in Japan's next generation of leaders and to connect them to their counterparts um, in the United States. Prior to his appointment as ambassador, he was chief executive officer and senior partner at Wilson, Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati, the leading law firm in the United States in the representation of technology, life sciences, and emerging growth companies. Um, and since uh, his uh, term as ambassador, he is now a member of the board of directors at Salesforce.com, and he's also on the global advisory board of Mitsubishi UFJ Financial Group. Please help me in welcoming our two ambassadors. Uh, so I'm going to take advantage of this great opportunity um, and uh, start off the questions myself, and then I'll give you a little bit of a chance to, to write down your note cards, um, and we'll be collecting them. Um, I encourage you on those cards maybe to note which ambassador you're directing your question to. Um, I'm guessing that you are all very curious about what it's like to be an ambassador. Um, but before we get to that, let's talk about what it's like to be a former ambassador, which is kind of more the recent, uh, recent present for our two distinguished guests. I'm sure people in the audience are thinking about various facets of this life, like do they um, disconnect your hotline to the prime minister's <laughs> office or the White House? Um, do you miss your staff at the ambassador's residence? Um, are you sometimes tempted to um, second guess your successors and call them up and tell them how to do things right? Uh, those are just some of the questions that you might address. 
but I'll leave it to each of you. Let's start with Ambassador Fujisaki and just tell us a little bit about what you're doing these days since you stepped down. Thank you very much for first uh, inv inviting me here to LA. Uh, this is a beautiful place. Uh, when I was in West Virginia, I said, uh, almost heaven, uh, whatever, <laughs> the Johnny Cash, but uh, this is heaven already here. Uh, the only thing I miss is that uh, American television doesn't show Japanese uh, 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 Olympic stars too much. Uh, it's all, only a focused on Americans, so, but that's okay. Uh, ex being ex-ambassador, first, uh, uh, on the retirement day, I said, now I can say anything. <laughs> and my friend said, but no one cares anymore. <laughs> <laughs> And the friend said, hey, Fujisaki, now you understand the importance of CSR. And I said, I knew the importance of corporate social responsibility. No, he said, the importance of car, secretary, and room, which are lose. Also, uh, I thought, uh, having stepping down from ambassador, um, I lost hundreds of staff and my wife acquired new staff, assistant, very in inexperienced one. So I'm now carrying her back. <laughs> That's how I like it now. Okay. Thank but you. I'm enjoying being a, a college professor and uh, being uh, president of uh, American Japan Society. And I'm uh, very happy that uh, this is a great opportunity to sort of uh, link up uh, the uh, American Japan Society in Japan and Japan American Society here uh, with uh, Doug and Peter Kelly and all those people. Thanks. Thank you, Ambassador Roos. To answer your specific question, yes, they do take away your hotline in a nanosecond. Uh, second, I miss terribly my residential staff. Um, I have um, uh, enjoyed driving my Toyota Prius but it drives me crazy now having to find a parking place rather than walking outside. <laughs> um, but it's, it's actually the adjustment, everyone says adjusting to being uh, ex-ambassador is, is very difficult. And uh, I loved my life in California in the Silicon Valley before I went to Japan and I came back. And uh, after four amazing years, uh, I loved my life uh, back here in California. Uh, but uh, actually, a senior person in the US government said to me, which I think is true, he said, having the experience that you had for the last four years will totally define the rest of your life and be a part of it. And I think that's absolutely true. And I think that um, now um, I am getting involved in a number of things that are US, Japan, connected, and I do think that that one four-year experience was not only the most unbelievable four years professionally and personally for me and my family, um, but also really I think it's going to define um, the rest of my career. Uh, well, thank you very much. So let's talk about the period as ambassadors. Um, as a political scientist, I just can't help but ask about politics, and you both were ambassadors at these remarkable moments of change in each country. And so I guess I'll start with uh, Ambassador Roos and ask about Japan, and then we'll go to uh, American politics. But um, in the Japanese case, you had a change in power briefly, uh, very, very quickly after you uh, took office. And um, the, L you know, the US government's gotten kind of used to working with the LDP, the Liberal Democratic Party. And so it's not just a, a standard change of government, it's a completely new team. Um, so I'm just curious if you can tell us a little bit about how it was like establishing these relationships when there really were no pre-existing networks, you know, to, to kind of forge those bonds with a completely new team on the other side, um, and also obviously some changes in policy direction as well. I'm right. so happy that uh, he asked that question to him, <laughs> not to me. <laughs> thanks. You're thanks, next. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, the first person I turned to for advice was Ambassador Fujisaki. Um, 
Well, you, uh, you're right that two weeks after I arrived in Japan, um, there was the election and the DPJ swept into power. And then uh, a year after, uh, a year before the end of my tenure as ambassador, there was a shift back to the uh, LDP. And I did not have the diplomatic background that Ambassador Fujisaki had. So when there was a shift in power, I of course assumed that there were deep ties in all of the parties uh, in Japan. But I learned that um, while as hard as our government and, to t and the nonprofit or uh, the private sector tries to stay connected to those in power and not in power, naturally there's deep, deep ties that develops with the party in power. And uh, when a new group comes in, uh, it's, a whole, it's a whole set of challenges. And I learned that in diplomacy, while there's a lot of continuity to policies, uh, when push comes to shove, um, personal relationships really have a significant influence on, um, on policy uh, and relationships between countries. So I felt a tremendous challenge um, in getting to know the DPJ. And um, at the same time, uh, I always felt it was very important to continue during those three years that the DPJ was in power to uh, reach out to the LDP and the other parties um, because things can change very quickly. Uh, I think it, it was an interesting period in that the first DPJ prime minister, Hatayama, um, was a Stanford graduate and I went to Stanford. And so the first meeting we had, uh, Prime Minister Hatayama uh, presented to me a Stanford football helmet because he loves Stanford football. And in fact, he was just down here. We had breakfast together on January 1st uh, for the Rose Bowl because former Prime Minister Hatayama wanted to come back to the Rose Bowl. Um, so I think we forged uh, uh, from the very beginning a, a very good, uh, strong relationship. And, uh, and yet the perception in the media and in the public was um, because of some of the positions he took on uh, the Futema issue in Okinawa and others, there was this perception uh, that there was a lot of tension in the relationship between the United States and Japan. Um, I don't think that was accurate. And um, again, through each prime minister and each foreign minister, uh, I think that uh, what I found to be incredibly important was to reach out to understand where they were coming from. Uh, the biggest issue uh, was the continual change in leaders. Um, for example, um, when the earthquake and tsunami struck, the foreign minister uh, had only been the foreign minister for three days and uh, three or four days, so for a very short period of time. And uh, he was a very experienced um, um, person, um, you know, but the reality is we had not had the opportunity to develop uh, the relationship over a period of time, which developing a relationship in a crisis makes it even that more challenging. So, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, it was challenging, but it also made it incredibly interesting. And uh, I think I was the only Obama ambassador that had five prime ministers. <laughs> right. Can you so. remember the names? <laughs> I do remember them. So meanwhile, there was an equally momentous change happening in the United States. Uh, Ambassador Fujisaki, uh, that you were uh, facing, uh, the uh, shift to, from the Bush administration to the Obama administration. Um, you know, it's not quite the same in the sense that, that we've had changes in, in part party power in the United States a little bit more frequently. But still, it was a pretty momentous election. And uh, in light of the fact that recent uh, reports are saying that Japanese really like Republicans better, 
Uh, perhaps you could see, uh, tell me what it was a little bit, how, how it was with that uh, kind of dealing with that change in power in the U.S. May I ask, uh, is that said by Republican people? <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, first, I have to say that I came yesterday, I'm, and I'm going back tomorrow. Uh, I just came for this meeting. I came here because it's the 10th anniversary of Doug Sun as well, but uh, the other reason is to convey this message. That is that uh, I think the perception here in U.S. is that in Japan it's CKF and thus JRF. Caroline Kennedy fever, John Roos forgotten. That's not true. <laughs> John Roos is well remembered because of that three him. I'll have we, to write we, that down. We, yeah, 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 <laughs> re report it. Uh, we could have gone through 311 really because we had him as ambassador. Really, he did a great job. I was able to see it from Washington how he had the trust of Washington, how he had the trust of Japanese side as well. So, uh, really, uh, Japanese people owe a lot to John Roos for that. And uh, one other reason I like about John Roos is uh, because uh, John said to me, he whispered to me before the session, Ichiro, don't worry, I'm more fresh as retired ambassador. Even if tough questions are asked to you, I'll take them all. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's such a great guy and his friend. <laughs> what was the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, uh, uh, from, I've got from, some tough questions for you uh, as well. <laughs> from Bush to uh, Obama, that was not that uh, uh, difficult, uh, I think. Uh, uh, during the uh, election time, uh, a lot of uh, journalists came up to me uh, and asked, uh, isn't, isn't that so that Japanese really uh, prefer Republican candidate McCain to Obama? And uh, I said, it's like a Christmas gift. That is that you don't say anything till the day, you open the box and cry out, this is just what I wanted. <laughs> so so th that was just what we wanted. <laughs> That's my answer. Uh, so I'm going to work on some more tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> Ambassador Fujisaki, but let's shift to international affairs, and I'll, I will start with Ambassador Roos, but I will come back. Um, you know, obviously we are all concerned about the frictions between uh, Japan and China. Um, and, you know, Japan and who? Uh, uh, Japan and China. Um, the issues of the islands, issues of <laughs> history, and historically the U.S. approach has been to let them deal with those issues, right? Not to get involved. And I think because of the, you know, the seriousness of some of the back and forth in recent years, there's been pressure to do more. Not necessarily to take sides, but to try to mediate perhaps, to try to moderate the positions of the two countries. So I was curious what your position, you know, what you think the U.S. can and should do about that and what the, maybe the best mechanisms are Right, what's, the, what, what's fruitful and what's not in terms of what the U.S. can do to, uh, to help uh, moderate conflict. Boy, can we get back to, what was it, uh, CKF? <laughs> <laughs> JRF. JRF. Um, you know, obviously I was dealing with this issue extensively um, during my time in Japan, um, particularly surrounding the Senkakus. And um, first, I think, uh, you know, I want to say that um, Prime Minister Noto was the Prime Minister when, um, the Jap when the government purchased the Senkaku Islands, which I fundamentally believe to this day that he did um, for the good faith reason 
of avoiding a more difficult um, situation. And um, I also believe that that should not have led to the exacerbation of tensions that it did. Um, I also, um, as I stated publicly and privately over and over again uh, as the ambassador, um, the U.S. is obviously involved uh, in the situation in that um, while we don't take a position on the sovereignty issue, so from that perspective, um, look to the parties to work it through. Um, because our security treaty applies to territories that are administered by Japan, and uh, the Senkakus are administered by Japan, uh, our security treaty applies to Japan. Um, and you know, Secretary Clinton, followed by Secretary Kerry, you know, made it clear that the U U.S. Uh, did not expect any unilateral ac action to change the status quo. So, from a public, uh, pers from a public statement and policy uh, point of view, I think we were very clear, and I think uh, remain clear to the, to this day. Uh, I think, you know, obviously, uh, and I was very appreciative of the fact that, uh, and I do believe that the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Abe did act with restraint um, in order not to uh, exacerbate um, the situation. And I think uh, some of the things that we've seen, you know, in recent months uh, are, are ratcheting up. Um, and, and I'm worried about it, as I think the whole world community is worried about the situation. Um, but I defer to our government, but I think it's a difficult, it would be a difficult situation for the United States to step in and try to mediate, uh, if that's the question, a mediate a solution to that. I think that, um, what we need to do in both the public and the private sector, by the way. Um, I think the private sector has a huge role to play. Um, I've met um, recently with a number of Chinese leaders uh, in the private sector who have um, told me, you know, how serious this is um, from China's perspective. And I have encouraged uh, them to um, make sure tensions get ratcheted down rather than ratcheted up. Um, so I do think there, there is that uh, role to play and a role to play behind the scenes in encouraging the parties to get together. Uh, but it's a tough path to see the, quote, mediation route. Thank you. I don't know how you feel about that. Are we allowed <laughs> to ask you questions? Uh, <laughs> So I'm going to, I'm going to t attempt my tough question for the other, for Ambassador Fujisaki. Um, again, relating to, I guess, recent news, um, you know, there's been a, a series of statements, or perhaps we might call them misstatements, from various Japanese public leaders. The most recent would be uh, the board members of NHK who have made statements about history which have inflamed, um, you know, sentiments in other countries. So not, I'm not really asking specifically about that, but I'm, I'm suggesting that there is uh, a history of either political leaders or private sector leaders, right, or people with, in, in public places making statements that I would argue undermine Japanese foreign policy. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is where's the balance? Because we know that Cabinet Secretary Suga said, for example, well, it, it, you know, it's, we, it, it's a country with free speech. People can say what they want, but how do you balance, on the one hand, protecting free speech, on the other hand, trying uh, to, um, you know, preserve good relations with neighboring countries? I would just want to kind of get your personal thoughts on that. Yes. Uh, sometimes I feel that uh, maybe we have learned too much of the uh, freedom of speech from our uh, good friend United States in that <laughs> sense. Uh, uh, our politicians go around saying everything uh, like uh, your senators and congressman, which is not in, always in line with the administration. And uh, that happens, but uh, we have to manage that. Uh, talking about uh, the Senkaku, one thing that uh, I would add to uh, what John Wu said, 
is that uh, please look back at history, how this has happened. After the World War II, uh, there was a San Francisco Peace Treaty in 1952, and United States have uh, borrowed this land of Senkaku for bombing site from Japan, and then returned it with Okinawa Reversion Act. So there was this recognition first. Uh, I know that United States would not want to uh, go into this uh, discussion, but legally there are bases already there. The second point is that uh, because of this uh, peace treaty, Article 5, which John Roos referred to, that U.S. Secretary Clinton, Secretary Gates, Hegel have all already repeated that you are, this, uh, these islands are covered by Article 5. This has been the biggest, I think, deterrence so that other countries would not really come into that island. If you haven't said that, it, there may have been some adventurous acts. So we are very grateful that this has been said, and I hope that this will continue to be said. I, I think this is the line I would like to say. Okay. Uh, so we're gathering some fabulous questions from the floor. Um, while I sort them, I think I'll, I'll ask one more question. 80% um, goes to John. Um, it's, <laughs> the early returns are not coming in that way. Uh, <laughs> come on, come on, more questions. Um, kind of at a more general level, with various international disputes, frictions, things that come up, how do each of you see the role of an ambassador? Right? I mean, because obviously governments fundamentally make foreign policies, but there is a very important role. You know, what's the best thing, the most important thing an ambassador can do? Let's maybe start with Ambassador Roos. Well, I, I think that obviously the ambassador needs to stay within the framework of the U.S. policy or the Japanese policy. Um, I think there's a couple of things. Um, number one, and, and from day one, I said to uh, our embassy, um, we have opinions, and in fact, we are on the ground um, seeing the day-to-day -day what's going on in the relationship. So we should be advocates for uh, policy positions. Uh, very early on, we've been talking a lot about TPP today, um, very early on in my tenure, I, I went public with a statement that, uh, that I thought TPP would be a game changer, which I've heard many speakers use today. Um, that was not technically U.S. policy um, at the time, it, and yet it was within the framework. And, and so I think part of what you do is you advocate, you, you try to move forward, but you, gotta, you do have to operate within the constraints of the policy. But on the flip side, you are articulating um, the U not only the U.S. position, but a lot of your own views and your own feelings um, come into it. So whenever, you know, you're the represent I was the representative of the president uh, in Japan. So I would articulate um, what I believe the president uh, would be thinking in different contexts. And, uh, but also, I, I, I think it would be disingenuous not to say that your own personal feelings and beliefs come into play um, as you're having these conversations. Because a lot of, to me, a lot of, obviously you're traveling the country, you're the face of the country, um, uh, in, in the, the country, in Japan in this case. Um, but you're also doing a lot of behind the scenes conversations. And um, that's where I believe you can have a tremendous amount of influence within this broad framework. Okay. Thank you. I totally agree with uh, what uh, 
Ambassador Roos said, uh, that is that uh, some people think that, hey, uh, instructions come from headquarters and uh, ambassadors are there to implement it. Uh, this is uh, uh, wrong in two sense. One is that uh, the instruction would not come in just out of blue one day. It, it, you know that it's coming in, so you'll have a telephone discussion or uh, you will send some cables and try to uh, discuss with headquarters how to sh shape it. That's the usual case. Second, when it comes, how to present it is the diplomatic skill that uh, you would not just read from uh, page one to page three all the way. You would put stress on some of the important parts or you just neglect some, you'd not neglect, but you would not to, 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 uh, put too much stress in. That is what we are there, there for. If uh, it's not that, uh, then it's, uh, telephone, uh, teleconference could solve everything. But as he says, uh, What's important is that you're on the ground and you're meeting everyone and you, ha you know how to uh, uh, implement these uh, instructions as well. Okay, great. So let's yeah. go to these questions from the floor. Um, here's the first one, and this one is directed to both, so I think I'd like to hear, or we'd like to hear from both of you on this one. What is the most important piece of advice you gave to your successor? You want to start? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, uh, my successor was a very experienced one, so uh, I really didn't uh, give that much uh, of uh, 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 advice to him. Uh, uh, it's about uh, personnel, uh, uh, personnel of the staff uh, or personnel in the American uh, uh, side. Uh, when you're meeting whom, uh, these cases, you should contact him or her or whatever, those things, and who in your staff, who would be the most trustworthy one you could uh, do things with. And it's not the substance of a security treaty or TPP or whatever, it's more of the personnel things, I, in my uh, case. I mean, I think the most important, uh, I hope the most important advice I gave was to trust your instincts, that, um, uh, both Ambassador Kennedy and I came in without diplomatic background. She obviously had much more of a background in the public eye than I did. But I think going into these jobs um, from a from, uh, different background, you bring uh, different qualities to the job. And I think that we all build up through our careers um, um, wisdom and judgment. I think uh, any ambassador uh, it, that comes in from outside the diplomatic corps uh, goes through a period where the, the best thing to do is to, to listen and to take in a lot of the information. Um, throughout my four years, I was just constantly learning. And I think Ambassador Kennedy uh, is, it will find, has already found and will continue to find it an incredibly learning experience, and you know, um, I, I think as long as she continues to trust her instincts and rely on her own judgment, she'll do a fabulous job. Thank you. Our, so we're going to go to uh, Ambassador Fujisaki. Um, there's two similar questions. I'm going to read them both. Um, it, it's about um, Northern Territories. Uh, First uh, is, do you believe Japan and Russia are close to resolving the Northern Territory dispute, and will this have broader implications? The second question, very similar, will we finally see the return of the Northern Territories from Mr. Putin's Russia to Japan and Prime Minister Abe? Uh, I think uh, there's a lot of attention now on that uh, negotiations, uh, but uh, I think we should be very prudent, should not be too optimistic about it. It may take a long time, and uh, one administration should not think that, hey, we should negotiate and make it a, a great success of this administration. These uh, issues are so uh, delicate, so uh, tough, and I think we should really go uh, very steadily, so that if we can make an advancement as much as possible, 
I would very much welcome it, but uh, I would not uh, think that we should uh, be dreaming that one day we open the newspaper and said, oh, this is all the four islands, we're just going to be back next year. This is, uh, well, I think a little bit too optimistic. Okay, thank you. Um, so I've collected uh, several questions together here for Ambassador Roos. That way you can answer the version you like best. <laughs> um, but I, and they may sound, these may sound more different, but, but the, the, the theme I see is <clears throat> the continuation of the U.S. commitment to Japan, particularly in military issues. Um, so the first one is, despite U.S. administration statements, there's a sense that the U.S. commitment to Japanese security has diminished in favor of the U.S. China relationship. Is that the case? Okay. Second one is, as a former sailor in the U.S. 7th Fleet, Far East, uh, would you comment on the current buildup of U.S. naval forces in the Far East? Uh, and the third is, can Japan continue to rely on U.S. leadership with stalemate in Congress? <laughs> um, they're all slightly different uh, versions of the same. So. Um, let, me, let me just say, I think that I know that the U.S. commitment to Japan and uh, the alliance relationship has never been stronger. And I think is only going to get stronger. Um, but, you know, President Obama, as, as you've all heard and read, has made this pivot, uh, so-called pivot, to uh, to the Asia-Pacific region because of its increasing importance uh, to the global economy in the 21st century. Uh, Japan is our most important uh, ally in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, it's been called cornerstone, linchpin, whatever terminology you, you use, um, the U.S.-Japan relationship is the key to um, our security posture in the Asia Pacific region. And uh, that is becoming increasingly important. Now that doesn't mean there are not issues. Um, we have to continue to reduce the impact of our bases in Okinawa. Um, that's a, a, a complex issue. Um, Japan, right, Prime Minister Abe is um, looking to Japan to uh, step up its defense expenditures and uh, supports collective defense from the U.S. perspective, uh, sharing the responsibilities uh, between the U.S. and Japan and our other allies uh, will be, become increasingly important as there's more pressure um, on all of our budgets. So I think the, the relationship and the alliance is evolving. Um, but I don't at all see it at all it diminishing in, in any way. And uh, you keep getting back to the basics that um, these countries you know, are democratic, share the same values, respect the rule of law, respect human rights, all these things that our countries um, share. Um, this concept that China is going to surpass um, or, or supplant the relationship with the United States is absurd. I mean, you know, both, both the United States and Japan and the rest of the world need strong and positive relations with China. I mean, we just heard today that, um, you know, China is such a big market um, for uh, the major corporations in Japan, as it's true of the United States as well. Um, but that is not because we, it, we need stronger relations with Japan. To me, it's, we're not talking about a zero-sum game here. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, this uh, for Ambassador Fujisaki. Now that you are free to say whatever you want. <laughs> but, but no one cares. <laughs> but we all care. Um, how would you evaluate Prime Minister Abe's foreign policy? Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, first of all, uh, I'd like to speak a bit on uh, the uh, China, U.S., and Japan relations before going into Abe-san's uh, policy. Uh, as for, uh, 
I agree with uh, John Roos uh, that uh, it's absurd to sort of equate uh, Japan and China and discuss zero-sum game. It's a totally different game because increase of Japanese military capacity, defense capacity, is, as he said, to the merit of United States because it would uh, have lesser share of responsibility on the United States. The increase of Chinese military uh, defense is demerit to the United States because you have to uh, catch up with it. So it's a totally different issue here. It's not a zero-sum or plus-sum. It's a, we, are, we are on the same camp where others are not. This is the fundamental difference. And uh, as for defense, of China, I had a conversation with Chinese military and diplomats. It goes like this. First, Fujisaki would say, we have been little too reserved to say that we need more transparency in Chinese military buildup. It's not the problem of transparency. Sheer size is the problem. You've been increasing over 10% for 20 years, and you're number two already. Why do you have to have such a big military uh, budget? The answer is, but you don't know. When Japan was growing, Japan's military defense was two digits as well. And one year, it was nearly 25%. To that, Fujisaki answer, wait a minute. That's uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when Japan's defense spending was one fourth of what it is now. It's totally a different story. Then, why do your people are still, 100 million people are under $1 a day income and you have to spend so much on uh, aircraft carriers and all that? And the answer was that, hey, wait a minute. Uh, Chinese is all around, around the uh, world now and uh, our interest is worldwide. So we have to have a strong military. My answer was, if you use that logic, that your interest is everywhere, your people are everywhere, so we have to have military to defend it. It's almost like Imperial Japanese Army's logic. But uh, I wouldn't go f um, further, but uh, that was the discussion on the air, uh, well, uh, which we had uh, with uh, about four months ago. But I'm not saying that uh, Chinese, uh, uh, I'm trying to be antagonistic to Chinese at all. I think we should be friend. And uh, what, when I was ambassador, I went to Japanese school, Japanese language school. And uh, what I said to students is exactly maybe against Mr. Abe's policy, but don't discuss territorial issues with Chinese kids or Korean kids. It's not necessary. You don't have to, you leave those to adult, grown-ups. You just get friend, to be friend with uh, Chinese-oriented kids or Korean kids. And those issues of territorial disputes, uh, you don't solve it. Uh, when you get uh, to college or whatever, study it, but uh, don't try to uh, go, go around discussing that. Uh, that. That's a little bit different policy from the uh, current policy, but I, I think that it's not so wise for uh, uh, Japanese or Chinese or Koreans to come to a third country like United States and discuss those issues uh, of uh, our history here. We have to solve it there in our country. Uh, I think his policy of uh, uh, trying to uh, strengthen economy is on the right track, and I hope he'll be successful. Uh, that's, I think, uh, very important. His diplomatic policy has been uh, very successful as well. Only <clears throat> not so successful was our relations with Korea and China, and I hope that maybe we cannot, uh, it's too uh, optimistic to say that we will uh, turn the table in a year or so. It may take time, but with uh, uh, 
we, we have to be patient and we should not uh, try to uh, uh, get uh, over uh, uh, political uh, uh, and uh, tr I think it's important that on our side, in ja on Japanese side, we should not try to uh, uh, groom uh, hate spirit against our uh, countries, uh, the surrounding countries. That's uh, more important. And I hope that uh, uh, we can uh, come around with uh, some more years to come. Okay, great. Uh, so I guess while we're on kind of foreign policy and security issues, I'll, I'll jump my own line and go here. Um, we've got a question who has a question, a similar question for both ambassadors. First, uh, to Ambassador Arus, what role in regional global security or peace do you want Japan to play as an ally of the United States over the long term? Um, and then after that to Ambassador Fujisaki, what role do you think Japan should play? in regional security? Well, I think Japan already plays a very important role. Um, but from, from my perspective, um, again, getting back to the fundamentals of the relationship, uh, I would like to see Japan continue to play an increasing role uh, worldwide. Uh, if you look at almost every issue, um, you know, Japan <coughs> playing a part in that uh, is, is critically important. I mean, you know, the, we've been concerned about the Iranian. Everyone thinks about Japan in terms of the North Korea nuclear situation. Um, but if you take, for example, the Iranian situation, um, the whole sanctions um, that have led to where we are today uh, could not have happened without Japan playing a significant role in that. And if you go around the world, uh, I think that's, that's true uh, in so many different cases. So uh, my short answer to that is Japan plays an important role, um, but as, it, as Prime Minister Abe continues to say, uh, an act uh, that wants to be more of a global country, if you want to put it that way, um, that's not really the correct way of saying it, because it already is. Um, I think that inures to the benefit of the United States. Ambassador uh, Fujisaki. I think uh, for Japan and for the rest of Asian countries, it would be more welcome that Japan stayed on the defense-oriented defense policy, uh, rather than changing totally uh, and uh, acquire uh, uh, offensive capability as well. So although we would increase uh, our defense, uh, I think it would be better to be in the realm of defense. And in order for that to be so, the one country has the key role. It's not China, it's not North Korea, it's the United States. If US continues to give reassurance to Japanese, like on Senkaku case, that we are here, you can count on us, then Japan can stay on this course. So uh, again, since North Korea came up, let's go with this one. This one is, uh, again, to both ambassadors. How do you predict that the North Korean regime will evolve in the next three to five years? And what kind of status for North Korea would be most desirable for Japan and the United States? I have uh, always been saying, uh, unlike what Mr. Inaba said about prediction. This is one of the most predictable country in the world because they don't have choices. They can't open up the economy totally. They can't just abandon the military total, totally. They have to go on, maybe negotiating, sometimes retreating a bit, go on, 
and continuing, continuing, uh, because the regime's most important objective is to survive. And in order to survive, you have to maneuver somehow and try to show that you're negotiating. Sometimes you retreat. That's what grandpa did. That's what pa father did. And now the young man is following the step. So this is my prediction. N no huge change unless, unless something erupts from inside. And that's unpredictable at all, that point. But from logical point, the leader cannot do anything else. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think that, um, you know, when Kim Jong-un came into power, there was this brief moment where everyone thought that uh, maybe there was a possibility um, that he could uh, head the country in a positive direction, and that did not turn out to be the case. Uh, I think it's important that the international community um, continue to apply the pressure, the sanctions um, that it has had. But, uh, you know, and I'm talking, I guess I am a private citizen, so I'm talking as a private citizen. I think whether it's North Korea, Iran, or whatever, um, you know, part of diplomacy is not to be naive, but to always look for the opportunities um, for a positive outcome. And um, I think that um, f during my four years um, as the ambassador, we were continually looking um, for ways to change, to, to convert uh, a bad situation into a um, non-nuclear positive situation. And uh, we had, it, no one has found that formula yet. The sanctions have to continue. Um, but I think that, um, to me, that's what diplomacy is all about. I'm making a statement on Iran now as well. Okay, terrific. Well, we've got a couple questions uh, for you, Ambassador Roos, about uh, President Obama. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll give you both. Um, the first one is, did you ever telephone President Obama when you had a problem with some State Department policy? Or did he ever call you to get your view on a policy debate within the United States? Well, I, I, I talked to him about different issues. I, had never, I made it a point never to comment on the, substantive, on the substance of what I talked to him about. Um, but whatever, I will say this, that uh, you have to be very careful with the president's time. Um, and I don't think... Uh, it would be wise of anyone to call the president to complain about State Department bureaucracy. <laughs> so no, I did not do that. But um, beyond that, uh, you know, I had I had a number of conversations with him. Obviously, not only just about Japan, but about uh, broader um, issues and policies as well. So there was a second question about President Obama, which was, uh, what is your view of President Obama's management style and his policy substance in diplomacy and defense? His policy substance in diplomacy and defense? Um, and also style, management style. I think, I think the president um, is a phenomenal manager. I know everyone's sitting there now talking, thinking about the healthcare website. Um, <laughs> but I think that um, I think that he is one of the, sh we're, we're lucky to have him as president. He is incredibly sharp mind. He gets issues. He, um, he seeks different viewpoints. He digests everything. He's not afraid to make a quick decision. Um, um, but he, he doesn't act erratically. Uh, he's calm in crisis. Um, you know, I, 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 when, when I've read these current stories about uh, are the Republican, I'm, I'm a Democrat, I'm not hiding that, um, are the Republicans better for, the, uh, for Japan than the Democrats? I mean, one thing that I felt from day one um, being, in, uh, being in Japan was that, boy, we really have 
a bipartisan consensus across the board on the importance of uh, the U.S.-Japan relationships and the importance of Japan to the United States. But getting back to decis decisiveness and, and the president acting on behalf of Japan, obviously the, the clearest example I had was during the crisis. Um, you know, Japan had been hit with massive earthquakes, tsunami, a nuclear crisis. Um, the president in a nanosecond, in a nanosecond said, get Japan whatever it needs. And you know, without the president saying that, you wouldn't have had 24,000 US troops uh, in Japan there as part of Operation Tomodachi. Our embassy grew by 150 people with nuclear experts, health experts, you name it. Um, ultimately, that was, you know, uh, a, a, I, I would hope every president would do that, whether a Democrat or a Republican. And I think the beauty of the relationship is it may be one of those um, important areas where there is bipartisan consensus. Uh, so for Ambassador Fujisaki. Do you know uh, Senator Max Marcus and how uh, will he be helpful to Japan's relationship with China in his role as M U.S. Ambassador to China? Uh, Max Marcus is a very special senator. Uh, there's a hundred senators on the Hill, but, and several senators invite ambassadors uh, uh, during summer vacation to their uh, home state. Uh, it, not every year, but uh, every two years or so. But this Max Bocus, <clears throat> when I was invited with Chinese ambassador and some other ambassadors, he was with us whole day, whole three days, uh, from breakfast to dinner, excursions. And uh, some, uh, to tell you the truth, some uh, uh, senators would invite people diplomats, but then just come in the dinner or say hello during lunch and make speech and go away. But that senator was really, uh, so a lot of us developed a very good relations with him and his team. And I think uh, he has a very balanced view of uh, China and Japan and uh, hope that uh, uh, he'll be su successful in China, but very frankly, I would not think that uh, it's not a role of American ambassador in Beijing to try to sort of uh, mend uh, the fences between Japan and China. So I, uh, I think uh, it's predominantly it's Japanese responsibility. But uh, any help, of course, would be welcome. But I think uh, uh, his first duty is to uh, see how the uh, Chinese behave. And what, I, if I may say a little, uh, I don't know, this is a little too much saying it, but uh, because I'm ex-ambassador, I, I would say this. Uh, one time uh, I was asked, uh, Fujisaki, you're lucky to be as a ambassador of Japan in the United States. And as I said, I'm so lucky. But if I had a choice, I'd rather be a US ambassador to Japan. <laughs> because all the door is instantly open. Imperial House, Prime Minister's office, and you will have the red carpet everywhere. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would not comment about Washington, but it does not happen to U.S. Ambassador in Beijing. And uh, so, uh, I, I wouldn't uh, want to be a U.S. ambassador in Beijing, but rather I would have John Bruce or <laughs> Caroline Kennedy. Uh, I, by the way, I talked uh, that about uh, Caroline uh, Kennedy fever. Uh, it, it is there, but she's so much welcomed. Uh, and uh, I said uh, she's ABC ambassador. Do you know what? Attractive, brilliant, and communicative. So she's very now welcomed. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, I was in uh, Washington too long, so I'm uh, addicted to acronyms. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> well,
Well, as you might suspect, uh, several of our audience members are interested in the ways in which history, and particularly the war history, affects relations between the various countries um, in Asia. Um, I'm going to go first, actually, to a Ambassador Roos, because this first question is uh, directed to him. Recently, Korean interests in the U.S. have started to set up statutes, statues memorializing the Korean comfort women in American communities, a move that many Japanese politicians have publicly criticized as being offensive to Japan. Americans don't seem bothered. Could you comment on what the U.S. position is on this issue, the government position, and what is this debate really about? Well, you know, let, let me comment generally on history issues. Um, and, uh, and I want to comment and tie it into my personal experience on going to Hiroshima and um, being the first ambassador to do that. Um, when I first got to Japan, uh, I wanted to go to, I wanted to bring my son to Hiroshima because I thought uh, he, he moved over there with me. My daughter lives here in LA and she wasn't there. And I thought it was important um, for him to understand the history there. And then at that point in time, uh, I got invited to the commemoration Ceremony. I know there's a long way of answering your question, but um, I wanted to go to that commemoration ceremony because I think that it's important um, for everyone to bend over backwards um, to, to, to understand, to bring people together, um, and to show respect. And I, quite frankly, underestimated the impact that that one visit would have on the Japanese people. And you know, I felt like I did all these different things while I was ambassador, but if there was one thing that really had the biggest impact, it was going to Hiroshima and the Japanese people for, for the rest of my tenure were thanking me um, for doing that, which was, I thought, the right thing to do. So that's a long way of saying all of these history issues, I think everyone, uh, whether it's Japan, Korea, China, everyone um, needs to take a step back and to try to lower the temperature and bend over backwards um, because there's a lot of pain associated with um, these different parts of history. And so I think, you know, whether it's erecting <laughs> statues or doing a lot of other things that exacerbate the tensions, I don't think um, that's positive. And that every country and every leader has a responsibility to do what they can to um, understand um, and to do what we all can to move forward in history rather than, rather than bring up uh, or focus on the pains of the past. Thank you. Um, so Ambassador Fujisaki, I, I, I would welcome you to, uh, to comment any way you want, but I'll just read one question on this issue, which is, what are the ramifications from the perspective of Japan over the long term of openly and assertively apologizing for past historical issues such as comfort women Nanjing, et cetera. Uh, first of all, uh, I think uh, there are two things. Uh, one is that uh, <coughs> uh, what f the fact that Japan has offered uh, a very clear apology, and not only apology, but on comfort women, uh, we have uh, admitted the wrongdoing, you know, established the uh, Asian Women Fund and uh, uh, offered the compensation. These things are not that well uh, grasped or recognized and some media says that Japan has done nothing. And this is uh, maybe uh, because uh, of uh, 
the lack of effort on our side, including when I was ambassador too. But I did not want to try to put these on the paper from our side, but when we are asked those questions, uh, I think we should be very clear in expressing what we have already done. That's point one. Point two, I think there are symbolic things. Uh, as John said, uh, 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 these uh, sort of uh, going back, uh, looking back and uh, trying to do things are important. Uh, when I was ambassador, there was a, uh, a 50th anniversary of uh, Philippine Bataan's uh, POWs uh, convention in Texas, and uh, that was the last one. And a Japanese uh, representative has never been there. Uh, and I was invited, so I went on my decision without consulting Tokyo, and uh, it was uh, very much appreciated. And uh, we started to invite the very old people, uh, the uh, POWs to uh, Japan. And I shared that with John before he went and said Hiroshima is so important to us as well. I think that, for example, our leaders should uh, for, uh, try to do a little more on uh, some of the uh, ex-war things uh, uh, as well. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it needs uh, some courage. But I, I think there are some things that can be done. But one thing I wanted to put on straight is that it's, it's, there's a misperception, maybe created, that Japan was so <coughs> slow or reluctant in doing things, and that's not true. So I wanted to share that with you. You know, um, just following up on Ambassador <coughs> Fujisaki, the, when I was there, the, the, each year we had the POWs. Mm -hmm. um, the surviving POWs from the camps um, during World War II to the residents. And the, they were over there because they were sponsored by the Japanese government uh, to come over. And there was one scene that, that where we went, uh, Foreign Minister Okada was a foreign minister at the time. And he met with the POWs um, and their families and, you know, bowed and you know listened to their stories and again it had such a huge impact and you just see all those types of examples that that's what's needed to change the dynamics of this situation and uh, that goes all the way around in a way we should have started a lot earlier uh, we have done that with other countries europe but uh, U.S. was left behind. So that was the reason that I was the first one to go. And uh, then the team started going and met uh, our foreign minister. I think uh, uh, somehow we have taken for granted our friendship with the United States and did not really do what we should have done. <coughs> and in our bilateral relations, this is the most difficult thing. We sometimes take for granted our friendship and think that we don't have to do it. Oh, they understand it. So this is the, I, I may repeat it again, but this is the most important thing, yeah. Okay, um, a, a very related question. Uh, we actually had a couple of questions on uh, Japan-Korea relations, mm -hmm. actually for both ambassadors, but I'd like to start with Ambassador Fujisaki on this one, <laughs> um, which is uh, maybe looking at it kind of more in a forward-looking way. What can be done to improve the relationship between Japan and Korea, you know, that, that is, is, seems so, so troubled at this moment. What would be the concrete steps uh, that Japan and Korea could take? I think uh, Japan has uh, continuously said uh, that uh, summit meeting we are very much open to, but uh, after the Yasukuni uh, shrine visit of Abe-san, it seems that uh, the uh, cooled down a bit, so we have to try to restart this uh, initiative. But we hope that uh, uh, through uh, multilateral 
meetings. There are many occasions now, ASEAN, APEC, ARF, where leaders can meet. So we hope uh, from those occasions they could start meeting and trying. This is a little t unusual and uh, for two countries neighboring to not to speak at the very top level. I hope uh, this could uh, be started. But uh, at the same time, uh, there are difficulties as well, I have to admit, because uh, we cannot concede, both sides cannot concede on issues. Uh, so try to sort of uh, put that on the table at the same time, but focus more on the positive side. I think that's the only thing we can do. Okay. Can I make two points on, on the Japan South Korea? First, on a, on a, a higher level uh, policy level, you know, one of the things I was often uh, saying to to uh, the leaders in Japan is, you know, it is so important for um, Japan and Korea um, to get close, and we will. Um, Re realize how, how uh, the opportunity lost if something happens with North Korea and um, US, Japan, and Korea, South Korea are not able to collaborate um, to the level that we should be able to. And so um, that relationship is very, very important and we all talk about it all the time. But I also want to say that um, and, and it's important to say that to a lot of you here because um, the Japan American Society, grassroots uh, interactions and the things that happen at the grassroots level are so important. I keep getting back to this, this people to people connections. I'll just give you one example of um, not bias, but my wife um, got invited to join this uh, group in Japan, a women's group uh, called the Nadeshko Kai, and uh, she loved it. And uh, at a certain point, she said, why don't we have the Japanese, the Korean ambassador's wife join? Um, and it was, well, there's tensions. Um, and they got over that. And the South Korean uh, wife joined and became an unbelievable part of this group, again, where the communications uh, overcame the barriers between the country. And then they came to Susie, my wife, and said, uh, can you get the Chinese ambassador's <laughs> wife to join? Um, and she did. Uh, most of you don't know my wife, but she will not let anything stand in her way on something like that. And, um, so this group ended up and now has the, you know, the American ambassador, the, the uh, Korean, the China, and uh, while the governments are doing their thing, in the end they're probably going to get these issues resolved. <laughs> and so the people-to-people -people connections uh, should not be underestimated. Um, so let's shift back to U.S.-Japan relations, which maybe is kind of our core issue. Um, and I'd like to ask both of you what you feel was the greatest success in terms of the bilateral relationship while you were ambassador, and what is the greatest challenge moving forward? Right? What's, the, what's the toughest challenge that your successors are going to be facing? Let's maybe start with Ambassador Fujisaki. Of course, the uh, toughest was the 311 experience. Uh, uh, by far, that was uh, most difficult uh, because uh, as you know, uh, at that time, Japanese side in Tokyo was in disarray, and as John Roos very well knows, and uh, we were not getting any instructions or whatever uh, information, but we had to manage ourselves but in Washington. But uh, I had uh, more than 100 uh, uh, top class uh, uh, staff from uh, all the ministries, and uh, I had friends in US uh, side who were really uh, working so well with all our staff. So 24-7 was not an exaggeration. The State Department made a 24-hour team and stayed on for three weeks. And, uh, uh, and uh, 
energy department, military as well. So uh, it was really tough. But uh, American churches, American people, American school, American military, everyone really stood up. And uh, so we should never forget about it. So uh, three years is approaching now in less than one month. But uh, from the bottom of our heart, I will express thank you very much to American people. Thank you. So how about the, the okay. uh, happy side was uh, uh, 2012 was the uh, centennial of the uh, Cherry Blossom Festival. Uh, of, uh, not, not festival, but the Cherry Blossoms in Potomac, uh, the uh, title base in Washington. And there was a lot of goodwill things. Uh, and uh, we were working on to that for years. So I, I thought I was very lucky to be ambassador then. Thank you. How about challenges going forward, uh, Ambassador Fujisaki? What do you think uh, your successor, what are the biggest issues, questions, challenges for the bilateral relationship? I think, uh, as John Roos uh, sort of uh, implied, uh, ambassadors are, uh, uh, have um, four or five different jobs at the same time. One, you have to be like a journalist in a way, always uh, get the first hand information. Second, you have to be a good communicator to make a statement so that uh, people, you can sort of communicate to people. Third, just like him, uh, you have to be a good lawyer to really go through the details. And uh, fourthly, you have to be like a hotel manager to uh, really organize a big event. And lastly, you have to be sort of a likable person as well. So you have to combine all that and all the issues are coming every day, different issues, economic, political issues. So you can't say this is the issue. It's not China uh, issue or North Korea or Iran or TPP. It's all the uh, at atomic. And it's uh, not like, I think in a way, it's like uh, more like president, as he says. All the issues are concentrated there. Uh, at least on Japan, US. So uh, I think uh, what's important is to have uh, the best staff and try to uh, uh, believe your instinct, as he says, and try to go on. And I think uh, my successor is uh, one of the best one up that I can uh, thought of. So I think he can manage this. Uh, does it sound a little too political and diplomatic? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, uh, I think the biggest success and the biggest challenge of my term as ambassador was March 11. Um, obviously, it was a potentially uh, defining moment in the relationship um, that could go either positive or negative. And um, it went positive, not just, uh, I saw our government, our military rise to the occasion, but the American people rose to the occasion. You know, this was something that for a year or two after and, and during the letters from elementary school kids, all this stuff that this incredible outpouring from the United States to Japan, to me, solidified um, the, or defined the relationship between our two countries. And uh, I didn't like living through it uh, at the time, but I'm glad I was there in hindsight. Um, I think the biggest challenge is going forward is um, the connecting our younger generations. Um, I know that's a, that's a long-term challenge, but um, you know, in the last decade, the number of students uh, coming from Japan to the United States declined by 50 percent. Uh, the number of students from here going over there is uh, flat, and. Uh, Ultimately, that's what's going to, you know, connect uh, the two countries. And so I, I, I wouldn't say that's the challenge of my, of Ambassador Kennedy. Um, that's all of our challenges, so. 
but really he made a change, really. By the way, I do want, I do want to say Ambassador Fujisai has been so nice on uh, his words. The first person that reached out to me um, when, uh, when I got confirmed, Ambassador Fujisaki hopped on a plane and came out uh, to Palo Alto and met with me. And, um, you know, from there we developed a, a phenomenal relationship. And it gets back to some of the things I was saying uh, earlier that all this stuff comes down to you know, people to people connections at every different level. And I think having those relationships, um, you know, make policy, you know, make relations between countries and are key uh, from top to bottom. But uh, I know he said, uh, well, I'm in California. Uh, don't you think it's better to come to California than staying in the East Coast? So I said, oh, of course, sir, I will come to California. <laughs> no, it was really, uh, uh, those four years, uh, he really made a difference, and uh, he will, is really well remembered. And uh, uh, because of this 311, what he did for this uh, Tomodachi yeah, operation, and, and also Tomodachi initiative, uh, really, uh, that was uh, really his invention. So. He has all the uh, credit for that. Um, one issue that came up during both of your terms was, of course, the issue of US bases in Japan. And at least from the outside, it seemed like it pretty well derailed things for a little while there. Um, and so I was wondering if, if maybe both of you could comment on, on what went wrong in, in the sense of, of that becoming such a big and contentious issue, um, and if there's a way um, either to resolve it or to, to move past that kind of contentious bilateral relationship. Do you want to start? Okay. Uh, when uh, Ms. Hatoyama came in with a commitment that uh, the uh, marine uh, uh, site uh, should be at least out of uh, Okinawa, if you look back at some of the newspaper columns, including uh, the top American newspapers, uh, many of them said, uh, hey, that's a small issue, the base issue. Japan news relations are a lot bigger. And uh, some of our pundits went around saying, this is a secondary tertiary issue. I thought that was very dangerous. That was exactly what some leaders wanted to hear. So I said, that's totally wrong because of two reasons. One, commitment is a commitment. When you say, this is a small part of commitment, so I'm not going to honor it, then other side can say, hey, Senkaku is a small part. We may not do it. And it's the collapse of uh, our security relations. Second, any issue, if it has gone up to a high level, like president, vice president, or secretaries, it's not a small issue anymore. And those people, the pundits, the academics, or the newspaper pe people, I think, did not have that sight and said, hey, this is, we can manage these issues. It's a small issue. I still think that uh, uh, those people should go back and read all the newspapers, what they had said three years ago. Thanks. I think, uh, you know, I think this, the, our military presence there is important but complex. And, um, you know, we've talked about the importance of the alliance, the importance for maintaining peace and stability in that region. The bases in Okinawa are very important, but it's also very important that we reduce the impact yeah, of our bases there. The, the agreement that was negotiated that took years um, to negotiate is now taking years to implement um, will significantly uh, decrease our presence in Okinawa and get that Futema base closed that everyone uh, says needs to be closed. 
Um, I think every ambassador, Ambassador Kennedy was just there this week, um, you know, surveying the situation. It was one of the first things that I did. I think, you know, it's, you, you do that and you can't, you, you, you're struck by a couple of things. Number one, you're struck by the importance of um, our presence as part of the alliance in Japan, but you are also um, recognize the importance of, of reducing the impact of those bases. And you know, when, when Prime Minister Hatsuyama came in, the issue got, um, got stirred up um, and then it settled down again. But if you look at the big picture, the big picture is um, the importance of the alliance, the importance of the presence, the importance of uh, continuing to work extremely hard to decrease the, uh, the impact of those bases in Okinawa. In a way, the options are only three. To just leave it in a densely populated area. Second, just to uh, get, uh, get away uh, get, uh, with the uh, bases and uh, uh, take the Marines out of uh, Okinawa. Or three, to move it out to less populated area and decrease the number, as he said. And, uh, in the uh, present circumstance of uh, Far East area, it's very difficult to foresee that we can just get rid of uh, the U.S. bases. And so, but we can't just leave it there. So the option of trying to decrease is the is deemed to be the most logical. But uh, still, uh, we have to be always very mindful to uh, the psychology of. Uh, uh, the people surrounding it. One time, uh, so, uh, one uh, prominent uh, leader of the United States said, uh, U.S. bases is something like oxygen. It's indispensable. I said, that's totally wrong. Oxygen, you can't smell it, you can't hear it, uh, no uh, disturbance. So, but U.S. bases are there to train, and they're uh, you have to have some disturbances so in order to lessen the impact, as he said, is the key issue. You have to have always that in mind. And I think American government and Japanese government is working pretty well on that. Thank you. Um, so in the spirit of moving to the uh, big picture, I guess I wanted to suggest that the U.S.-Japan relationship is both a bilateral relationship and a partnership. I mean, and I guess that, in a sense that's obvious but in the sense that it, it both operates on very, bi very bilateral issues, like the bases, like trade issues, but it's also a partnership that functions at the global level in, in terms of, of global issues. And I think the, the rhetoric about that has been around for decades. There was a common agenda, et cetera, of, of, of what can the U.S.-Japan do on issues that aren't specific to that relationship. So I guess my question for both of you is, one, um, how can, U.S. and Japan move more in that direction, uh, and uh, what would be the areas where you think, the substantive areas where you think U.S.-Japan collaboration would be most important on working in issues that tr transcend that two-country relationship? Who's first? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think um, when you talk about issues that transcend that two-country relationship, when in the prior discussion on TPP, some of the things that we we're talking about, um, you know, rule of law, intellectual property rights, um, human rights, that's not TPP, but all of these things, I think, I get, I get back to Japan and the United States sharing the same values. And um, in working together throughout the world, um, I think it's going to become it already is important, uh, it is going to become increasingly important. Um, there is a perception, uh, or the common phraseology is Japan punches below its weight on the international scene. Um, you know, when I arrived, in, and when you go through the confirmation process, you spend a lot of time studying all the different issues. It was very interesting to see the incredible role that Japan plays. Uh, worldwide already. Um, and so I think that as Japan gets stronger economically, as our own country gets stronger economically, jointly 
uh, again, on those values issues, that's where I think uh, it's going to be increasingly important for both our countries to collaborate and play a role. I think uh, on the value issue, uh, U.S. and Japan has been on the same track, but uh, at the same time, we have uh, used a different uh, uh, manner of uh, diplomacy. Uh, I think uh, Japanese style was a little bit more discreet, uh, and uh, U.S. was a little bit more uh, or uh, trying to come uh, more clearly on the surface. And uh, uh, it's not a good cop, bad cop, but it's a, a sort of a combination. And I think that has worked pretty well on Iran, Myanmar. And uh, we had uh, relations all the way with uh, Iran. We had all the uh, relations with uh, Myanmar. And uh, now both countries are working on it. And, uh, but uh, the Japanese channel uh, has, I think, been quite uh, effective uh, as well. So uh, maybe uh, if you're talking about the, uh, this uh, value, we may not take the same uh, 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 strategy or uh, tactic, but uh, on the, uh, as you say, the objective is there as well. And uh, I think there are a lot of things that Japan can uh, work with the United States uh, on uh, environment issues or economic issues, uh, Asian uh, 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 issues. The most important thing is that Japan and US share not only the human rights or democracy or these value issues, but the most important I thing that we share is that we are happy with status quo. We are happy with the status quo in Asia. There may be something that has been adapted, there has to be change, but not fundamental change. And this is the thing that Japan and United States Korea shares. And sometimes that is forgotten. And sometimes things different is highlighted a little too much. So that is what I think I would like to stress on. By the way, can I just add that uh, Ambassador Fujisaki talked about climate change. That's one area, environmental, climate change, where we're the two most innovative countries in the world. Um, I saw amazing things going on in Japan uh, in that area over the four years I was there. Um, that's an area where I think the two of us could do a lot more to provide leadership in the world. So on that note, I hope you will join me in thanking our two ambassadors for an absolutely fascinating session. While they're taking their photos, um, Let's give them another round of applause. We are certainly served well. The U.S.-Japan relationship is served well, and both of our countries are with impeccable diplomats, such as Ambassador Fujisaki and Ambassador Ruz. And also, I'd like to thank Dr. Vogel for your outstanding job chairing this. And let's give another round of applause to our speakers. All of them, they're up here at the front. We want to thank the Sasakawa Peace Foundation for making this possible, our partner, the J Japan Business Association of Southern California, our partners and collaborating organizations that are in your program, our official airline, United Airlines, uh, especially the Intercontinental Hotel, and uh, the last is our staff and the volunteers. I'd like to give them a round of applause for helping put this on. And we thank all of you for attending. We hope we can make this a, an annual event. But now uh, there's adult beverages available in the foyer. Please enjoy the networking reception. <laughs>